Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of the Happy Head Podcast. I'm your host, Paul, and today I'm joined by the gorgeous Marnie. Hey, Marnie, how are you doing? Oh, very well. Thank you, Paul. How are you? I am fantabulous. Thank you very much. I've had a very good day. It's been very uh, busy, but it's been good. It's been fun. And it's topped off with, this is the last thing of my day, an interview with, well, not an interview, a conversation with your good self. I, I feel so lucky. I'm honored. Oh, you are. You are. I just lay it on me. I feel so honored. <laughs> so listen, <laughs> Marty, in yeah. a minute, tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, sure. I like to consider myself a human being, first of all. Um, I am a recovering musical theater actress, conservatory trained, but now I have moved into teaching voice, breath work, movement, fitness, wellness, and I teach from 10 years old all the way up to expert teachers and even government officials how to love and communicate better. Wow. How was that? Less that than is, a minute. Yeah, yeah, that's in less than a minute. That's about 25 seconds or something. I think so. How did this all start? What got you on this this path? Uh, well, it was actually long, circular, falling off ledges, under table type of dancing on bars kind of path. So very disjointed. But um, I think it was birthright. I think I actually came out of the womb on this trajectory and really backed off multiple times. So... The, the few things that I think are interesting tidbit, so there it is, it showed up in real life, tidbits of information is I have a speech impediment, multiple learning um, difficulties that I had to overcome, which backed me away. And there was this backed me away off of being myself and going on this path. But there was that pivotal moment that people talk about where something hits you so hard that you cannot look back or do something, you have to go for it. It's a push. So quickly, what it was that got me on this path was I did not want to work in a grocery store after divorce. There's nothing wrong with working at a grocery store, but I knew that's not where I was going to have the biggest impact. So with my skills in theater, with my skills in physical training and yoga, and with my skills of being a total noodle like a character type of a noodle, I recognized that what I wanted to share with the world, and it took me years to get here, was I had to be me in front of them. And that seems to really be working. Since I have found my voice, and again, I hiccup all the time, I make mistakes all the time with my speech, I'm very effective in helping somebody else figure out what's the vibration, what's the tone, how do they want to hit people? And I don't mean with a fist, but I mean with love. So you had these kind of challenges as you grew up. Is yeah. that what pushed you into theater or was it kind of something else? A hundred percent. I mean, not a hundred percent, seven, a million, two million, billion, zillion percent. I definitely had that little girl fantasy of watching the Nutcracker and saying, I want to take ballet. And I did. Um, I struggled. I didn't struggle with dance. I struggled with speech. I struggled with confidence. So I didn't really get into singing until my teens. And I also had a, because of the vocal issue, I can't, I didn't actually anatomically breathe right, physiologically breathe right. So singing did not come easy for me, but I persevered. Emotion and passion overran the difficulties. And it was the day that I recognized that I had passion on stage, I seemed to come alive on stage, things then started to move really fast. Within two years, I had a full, well, not a full, but more than a partial scholarship to a huge conservatory in, in America and uh, went to New York. So it really did come together. It kind of fixed the difficulties and the obstacles growing up and gave me confidence and gave me tools to lean on so I could communicate better. And it still took a long time. You mentioned there, Marnie, about having uh, physiological challenges with breathing. Mm -hmm. But we don't need to have physiological challenges with breathing because most people don't breathe right anyway. Right. That's why I teach it. it you don't what, know what you don't know. That's what I was going to say. What is it about breathing, which is the most natural thing we can do, that 
stops us from breathing properly? Is it laziness? Is it a lack of knowledge? Is it poor understanding of how the body works? What is it that stops us from breathing properly? You mean yes? All of those? I think first and foremost, it is a lack of awareness that you're not breathing correctly to stress. So just what happens to the body and the psyche and where those two points come together lodges in the chest. And so anytime we are provoked or think something is just around the corner, our breathing apparatus changes, our physiology changes. We don't pay any attention to it. And so we condition and repattern over and over and over bad breath. So we just don't even notice where our breath is. We don't notice where our chest is. And it is a very easy fix with the commitment. I just feel like I wanted to answer your question in a different way. Okay. You, don't know, you don't know what it is that you don't know. And with, I would say, 90%, that is a percentage picked out of the air, don't recognize that they breathe shallow. They don't recognize that they breathe fast. They don't recognize that they have no ability to control carbon dioxide. And why should they? Why should they? We're not, we weren't taught to do this. And there's other reasons that add to the dysfunction or the incapacity to understand it because most of our peers are doing the exact same thing. And we are, you know, we're copycats. So I love meeting people who really want to breathe and say, I recognize the issue starts with me. So does the solution. So I interrupted your kind of flow there. We got to the conservatory on a scholarship. Yep. We're loving what we're doing. We've discovered Loving. this fact that we come to life when we hit the stage. Yeah. What happened at the end of, I'm guessing, college time and you finished the conservatoire? You know, no one's ever asked me that question before. Uh, at the point of graduation, you know, I, I'm sure they do this in all different countries. You get like a paper plate award. Like, who are you? That You know, your peers tell you who you are. I was voted most likely to be buried in a matching bow, pearls and matching shoes and to be the first one onto Broadway. That didn't happen and I'm not dead yet. So I guess we could still have a bow in my hair, pearls and matching shoes. Um, at the end, I actually got a gig, a cool gig the day upon graduation. I was set. I was like, dang girl, how did you score that role in that amazing production pre-Broadway? I got to be in Boston at Harvard to perform and it was amazing. Um, but the transition into New York for me, when I finally made the move a few months later, it was just back at the bottom of the bucket. I thought I was a good listener. I was a good networker. I was a good negotiator. I'm a good student. I'm a good life liver. Um, so that sounds like an organ, didn't it? A life liver. <laughs> I was living life. I was totally connected. Um, but I got, I got, it got old. It got old fast. It got old fast. I was also there for 9-11 at my last year there. And that really put a damper on the progression of uh, how I was loading up my resume for theater. I did love it. I absolutely adored theater, but I didn't adore professional theater. I had adored creation. I adored uh, coming up with characters. I adored working with the talent across the table, meaning directors, meaning writers, meaning composers. I like inception and conception. I like art. I did not like commercial theater. I didn't like doing the same show every day. So I think that's called um, Off-Broadway. Those kind of is, Art Nouveau kind of stuff? There's that. There's that. And those were some of my most favorite experiences by far. Um, but to be completely honest, and I said this a lot, my favorite performances were in college. I liked Off-Broadway. That was fun, but it was scary. I mean, I'm not too... Scary is not an unattractive thing for me. I, I can deal with scary. I've always been pretty brave. Um, but what I, there was just some, may I curse? 
Of course you can. Help yourself. Some weird fucking shit off Broadway. Some weird fucking crap. And so there's a, there's a trust factor of who are you working with. It's kind of like being on a podcast, Paul. You don't really know who you're talking to. When you're in off-Broadway, you don't really know who you're working with, and you don't know who's going to see you. And I'm lucky I got to remain, I remained clothed, you know, 100% of my on-stage time. Um, that was not how the world wanted to see me back then. But my favorite experiences were in the laboratory theater of being in college. Those black box productions where the artist, well, and the composers and the people who are putting the pieces up were just as experimental as I. Big want, big want, big risk, big payoff. So would you kind of say that was the peak of your kind of getting the most out of it, getting the most enjoyment out of that aspect of theatre? The enjoyment, yes. It was in college, and I'm so sorry for every little girl that I train and every little guy that will whoever comes across my path to learn the art, I tell them like the ins and out of what it's really like, but yeah, that the enjoyment was in college. I, that is not to say I didn't enjoy being in New York, that I didn't enjoy being on the road. I did enjoy, but I didn't feel like I was living what I was supposed to be doing. And I just wanted that goddamn feather in my bonnet to be on that recording of a Broadway cast album. And I finally said, this is a really stupid want. This is, this is, this ain't worth it because I knew I wanted to have kids too and having kids in New York being in, being on Broadway. And uh, I mean, again, I was, I was up for those parts a million times. I, I knew the life. I knew what I was signing my life away. So I do think very protected that it was not where I was meant to be. And I'm so okay with that now. At the time, did you know where you were supposed to be? Did you have an idea? Did you have an inkling? Or was it just a feeling that you weren't in the right space? That's a really wonderful question. And I actually know exactly how I want to answer that. As a coach, as a teacher that we both are, we have to be very careful of how we lead the people who come to us. And it was the day before classes start at the Boston Conservatory of Music, like the Harvard, it's like Juilliard. I showed up in Boston and I met a few people who were going to be peers and we went to a psychic fair and this story has a has a punchline or an end. We walked down Newberry Street in Boston and it's a beautiful and amazing and I was overwhelmed by the coolness and how lucky am I and we went into that uh, whatever convention center and went to a psychic fair and I met a beautiful woman who was my psychic that I was assigned to that says, you will either be a muse or a teacher. And I'm like, ooh, I like the idea of muse. What do you mean by that? She's like, you are going to be the kind of person that people will write for or you will teach them. That was always in my brain the entire three years that I was at the conservatory. It was where I was on graduation day. Am I a muse? Or am I going to be a teacher? I went to New York and it just kept feeling like there was muse sniffing. I got to I got to originate a lot of parts, but I didn't find any writer marriage ships. So it was always on my mind that maybe she was right, which is why I circle back and say we have to be careful. It almost became a self-fulfilling prophecy, or in this case, maybe divine intervention. Yeah, I didn't really feel it was my purpose to be on Broadway. I didn't want to be the 87th Fontaine in Les Mis. And that's where I was in, in you know, in the line. 80, there's not a lot of fame with 87th Fontaine. If you speak musical theater, Les Miserables. So we've discovered the fact that oh, we, we've getting this inkling that we're not really where we want to be, but we're kind of still there. There's the idea that we want to start a family and raise kids. So how did you kind of pivot from there? Well, it took me uh, going back to college and making my peace, which was really a flirtation because it didn't come easy to say, okay, here I am in New York. I, I want to get married. I want to have kids. I don't want it to be here. I don't want to go on another tour. I don't want to live out of a suitcase. I don't want to sing from the, the score of Footloose. 
a 700th time. That wasn't fun. That was not fun. It was not fun. It was torture. Um, I decided to go home to Maryland, which was outside of DC. And then I thought I'd be a big fish. And I ended up getting married within the year. Um, got pregnant. I had a honeymoon baby. And I just kind of transitioned out of theater. I didn't say goodbye. It, to be honest, I really didn't say goodbye. I just flirted with saying goodbye. I didn't think it would be so. So there is a good 10 years of, who am I? I mean, there really was. It was pretty intense. I was lost. That, you know, it's interesting because we, we've had this feeling for quite some time about not quite being in the right place, not quite fitting in the right way. And then kind of suddenly things fall into place. And before you know it, stuff is happening, stuff is tumbling in and for the, the dice are falling in the right way. Super fast. I don't know if I said it at the beginning of the podcast and I said it took some time, but in comparison to the trajectory of like how my life unfolded, no, super fast. It was super fast. Um, so I can be as succinct as I possibly can be. I'm a popcorn kind of thinker. And I always say is to jump in, to, well, figure to bed with me, you know, you have to go for the long haul. I begin to totally make sense after a while, but getting to settle in sometimes it's like, okay, what language does she speak? Um, but yeah, once I realized that, yeah, I'm really in the wrong place and that I'm continually in the wrong, continuing to follow the path of not understanding myself or giving myself the space to learn about myself. I wasn't fully shut down. I was still working on really necessary crafts but I let me say from this perspective meaning where I am right now looking back through the last 10 years of my life everything that happened in the last 10 years of my life is a skill that I needed a skill that taught me something that's unique to me and really passionately integrated in how I teach so teaching early childhood music and movement seems really random in this story. And some people will say, oh, well, there's a music connection. You became a mom. Why wouldn't, you know, maybe that's what happened after you became a mom. You worked and taught like music together or things that were early childhood education. But it was a vital skill to how I teach now. I needed to have that, those years there. I mean, there's a strong correlation. Do you think... Or do you believe that subconsciously you didn't have it mapped out, but you knew that you had to have certain skills to be able to get you to the part of the journey where you wanted to do the thing that you're doing now? Or was it just random? It did feel random at the time, but you said subconsciously. So I would say subconsciously when I was teaching early child and music and movement with a one-year-old and a three-year-old, and I mean, they got older and I continued to do it, that I recognized that what, how I presented in those businesses, in those companies that taught that kind of product of classes, that I was writing curriculum, and I was becoming more and more acutely aware that this was something I needed to do. And I was extremely aware that I got to perform for 45 minutes and I had eight to 10 little fans loving me three times a day. And Miss Marnie and the JJs did arise from that, which was me and my singing group that sang early childhood music. I'm like, hey man, if I can't be on Broadway, they don't know the difference, meaning the, the kids that were watching me. So yeah, on some levels, actually now that I say it, multiple levels, I was getting my butter, my bread buttered. But the skill building that I learned on the structure of how to teach, the structure of understanding child development, the structure, so importantly, is watching these parents own their children, have ownership in these classrooms was foundational to what kind of who I wanted to be. I don't want to be, I love my moms and I loved my caregivers and I loved my dads that would show up in my classes that would say, oh my gosh, take my baby, perform for them because you're good at it. As they would back up and say, okay, coffee talk. I need a break for my kids. I knew there was something inherently amiss and something had gone amok with how we raise children. And so I paid really close attention to the conversations in that room 
And that left a very indelible imprint on how I was parenting and how now I coach children and how I coach the parents. Because again, we didn't talk about, I coach from 10 up to 80. So my language system changes to fit the needs of what we're working on. That's a huge range because most people tend to kind of focus either on children or teenagers or young adults or people between 35 and 45, whatever. That from yeah. 10 to 80 plus, that's a huge range. How how do you kind of get your head around the, the different needs for your different clients? I wish I could ask them that. Um, hmm. I'll tell you what I think it is. I have an innate ability to kind of tune into the spirit of what they show me. I have a really, because of the theater training, I have a really good ticker gauge on what character of themselves they're showing me. Like, who are they showing up in the room? I have an incredible, strong capacity to understand the linguistics and just the, you know, the facial affectation of what people are doing. Um, and I really ask them. You know, if it's a 10-year-old and they say they want to sing with me, and I get a lot of that, they don't want to sing with me. They want a mommy sometimes, sorry. They want a mommy sometimes that can just love them and just give them a free, clean space, an hour where they can just talk. And then when we sing, we kind of clean the soul for a little bit. We get the energy moving. If you're getting no, your head around that. No, no, I was just about to say that is so important but also it's kind of so sad that a lot of parents don't see the need for the child to have that intimate connection that I am focused on you I'm not watching the tv and watching you play I'm not on the phone talking to somebody else and watching you play I am fully engaged with you I will say this with 100% certainty and clarity, the judgmental Marnie who showed up in those early childhood music classes as the teacher, and I was judgmental, it was really impactful for me, is completely different now. I am absolutely 100% compassionate with the parents because I do believe they are showing up the best way they know how with what they got. We are all in this, you know, worldly gook that there's just too much stimulus and information coming in. So I completely get why a parent can't fill every single one of their kids' buckets while they're trying to take care of themselves and their husbands or their wives and work. I mean, the to-do list from day to day for most people is astronomical. And if they want to give me their child for an hour, knowing that I will so tightly bond with the, the person driving the car, and I will so 100% bond with the person who then comes into my room and, or my studio, that I'm working, we're, in, we're completely in concert with each other. Um, that's why I didn't become a traditional therapist, and even though I have a lot of trauma therapy in my education. Uh, because I didn't want, I, it, just, it didn't make sense to me. I needed parents to understand their kids. I needed kids to understand their parents. And we needed to come together and be better friends. So if you want to sing, you know, from Les Mis with me, and then go, I mean, this happens like every single time, Paul. You know, I dreamed a dream. Can I tell you the story of what happened in school today? Yes, you can. Yeah, well, you can. What happened in school today? Okay. And then... The music just shakes up the emotions. It just kind of is like an invitation to where am I right now? And I'm in a safe space, meaning me. And if people, if I can do that for people and connect them back to the person who loves them the most in this world, I'm going to do that. So what happened in school today then? What was the, the thing that sparked that thought? Oh, my client, my team. She is just this incredible spirit. I love her. I wrote her a letter of recommendation to go uh, for a trip abroad to Israel. She is a lot like me where she came out of the womb just a little bit different than the majority. An IQ and a capacity off the flipping chart. But born into a 
as I call, inside the Beltway, the, the Washington DC area, the, the, the stew pot of stew and politics. Really, really, really wonderful, gorgeous, beautiful, highly educated, extremely charismatic, alpha dog, neurological stress messes. You know, there's just so much energy all the time. And when you have this precious baby who's a little bit different, the expectation is great to fit in to wor the world, into private school, fit into private school, get a 1400s on your testing to get into college, be amazing, do great stuff. So she, in this particular case, was singing. She wasn't singing I Dreamed a Dream, but she recognized in this particular day that nobody at school liked her that she could not figure out a possible way to fit in with her peers in this school. So that's what we worked on. That is so sad when you, you know, or you believe that you don't fit in into an environment. I mean, I can say that because I was pretty much the same as this girl you're talking about, that, you know, just whatever I tried to do was the wrong thing. <laughs> I just never fit in. Well, so many of us, when there is a real, I'm, there's no mistaking in me, you know, reading your profile, meaning just seeing your energy in front of me, the intellectual capacity to understand concept conceptually and, you know, just thematically. So we are born that way. You didn't learn how to be smart. You just learned how to be effective. And uh, this is my client and this is me. I, we, we are given obstacles. So we work harder to figure them out. So there are people like you, I'm guessing, but like my client, like myself, is because we knew love leads the way. And we knew that being friendly leads the way. We tend to lean in when everyone's pulling back. So they lean in more. So that's in this particular case with my client, even though she's here and 16 years old to sing better, which she is, she's singing beautifully, is we're really working on how she floats in the world and to self-soothe when the expectations are super, super high and to recognize that she's picking up skills like me working in a music school that will benefit her when she goes to college because I guaranteed her she'll be fine in college. Oh, there's going to be a lot of nuts like you. You're only two years away of finding many of you. I promise you that. So it's just soothing her till she gets there. And that's a really important message because I'm guessing going to college, going away for, from home for the first time is a big, big deal. And if yeah. you kind of think you don't fit in now, going to somewhere like college must be terrifying. I think so. I mean, I have a 17-year-old at home who is not so different than my client. Um, it has to be terrifying, but I think it could be and. I think it's terrifying and exciting. And I always say some of the best parenting you can do is let them go away. Let them stop parenting them. Let them try themselves on. I mean, I don't know about your parents or what your story is when it comes to the specifics, but I, my father always said to me, if you never speak to me again once you leave, I have done something right. Which is probably inaccurate, but he thought that was like, you have life skills and you can go on. He wasn't saying reject me. He was saying is if you don't need me, you've done something right. Hmm. But that is I'm so important. It really is because I get the distinct impression today we are really overprotective of our kids. And I go back to my childhood. Yeah, and yeah. school Funnier. holidays. I lived on a um, what we call a council estate, which is for people that can't afford their own homes and can't pay landlords and stuff. So social housing, I think is the phrase. Anyway, school holidays, about nine o'clock, all the front doors would open and all the kids would be kicked out and you'd just go and amuse yourself. At 12 o'clock, all the mums would stand by the door going, Paul, Susan, Angela, yeah. lunch. And we'd all go in for lunch. About an hour later, we'd all be kicked out again. And then at five o'clock, it was repeated. Yeah, all the doors would open, the mums would come out, Paul, dinner, you know, and we'd all go in, and that was it for the day. Yeah. And you just got out and you entertained yourself. The only time you were allowed to stay indoors was if it was really, really raining heavily. A mild bit of drizzle, no problem, you still went outside. And so we went out and we amused ourselves, we offended for ourselves, and we got on with stuff. Yeah, we, we fell over, we climbed trees, we fell out of trees, broke arms and scraped knees and stuff like that. Yep. But it was such a, a 
the most important way to to teach kids about risk. You know, you learn that if you you climbed a tree, you might fall out. You might hurt yourself, but you did that. You know, uh, playgrounds today, they're all kind of got all this soft padding everywhere. So if you fall off one of the things, you don't really hurt yourself. Well, if we fell off, we we scraped knees, we cut ourselves and all kinds of stuff, you know. But it teaches you independence. It teaches you what level of risk you're comfortable with. But today we kind of send people out into the world with with no idea of of risk and what they're comfortable with and what they're not comfortable with. I mean, not only is it so true, it's crushing. And yet I still go back to first saying is I think we live in a world where we're really doing the best that we can. And it's super easy to recognize the dysfunction (laughs) because it's dysfunction and the easy way to kind of get through the day. And in our case, what we're talking about is we did used to, I mean, I was pushed out the door too. And I grew up in an affluent community outside the DC area. I mean, I was a princess in training um, and I was still pushed out because who wanted to sit inside and play a board game? They're called board games for a reason. They're boring. I was a creative. I wasn't scared of the tree. I wasn't scared of falling. I loved roller skating. I loved going fast. I loved um, being free. I didn't love not being cool. And I didn't have the same fear as these kids do because nobody would pick on me when I was at home. There was nobody was coming in on my phone or in my iPad. I wasn't playing in chat rooms. I was playing with the known entities, meaning my two friends, writing magazines and drawing and picking up worms and shopping and I mean honestly I was in the workforce at 18 sorry at 14 years old I was working trying to make a little bit of money because it kept me busy because my parents were worried about me but I look at my kids their generation and uh yes they are the stress is off the racks off the charts it is deafening because they don't explore and that's not to say all of them because I'll like open my front door in uh, only Maryland, I'll see kids on their bikes, but it's not, there isn't that freedom because the parents are being conditioned for a million reasons. And a lot of them are good reasons. A lot of them are just bad press of where are your kids? Mm. This could be the day they get hurt. This could be the day that someone brings a gun to school and it's that tape then, and that goes right back to the breath. They don't even know that they're in a locked position every single time. They're like, should I be worried about my kids right now? And I really don't know how to remedy these really um, catastrophic and huge issues. And I don't think it is, this is not far away from what it is that I do on a you know micro level with each person is how to, let me try to string this together. My kids that come to me that are under the age of 20 are stress ridden. My adults who come to me who are older than the age of 20 are stress driven. If there's not enough stress, something's wrong. And that is an energetic exchange that they share with their offspring. It doesn't have to be in words. I think that's the part that where what I do is so unique. I mean, I'm not the only person who does what I do, but I'm the only Marnie that does what I do. And my experience of how I got here is unique. I always talk about it's the energy that speaks so much louder than words. And it's the energy we feel in our body that our kids receive, that my dog who's on the couch receives is when I'm nervous, they're aware of it. When my kids are nervous, I'm aware of it. And that's the kind of the sticky goo that where I think we can make the biggest impact to kind of unplug, calm down, and kind of renegotiate how we love each other and how we care about each other. It's just not the words. The words just make it worse. What is one thing a parent who's listening to this conversation and thinks, hmm, yeah, I see what you're saying. What's one thing they could do to kind of help themselves and their child? Just what one kind of simple thing. Don't take this wrong, parents, but calm the fuck down. Just calm down. Your kids are going to be fine. And some of them won't. And they don't belong to you. 
They just agreed to come here to teach you. I, the number two thing I would say to every parent is they are your best. They are your best teacher. You are the student. They are the teacher. You just help lead them along the way. And I will say that in my experience doing what I'm doing, and again, you know, we're only a couple years in, but I've been here a long time on the planet, that when I see friends or family members or a client of mine recognize, oh, my beautiful child taught me something about me and I have shifted, that's a glorious moment. Those shifts are for life to me. They're, they're big shifts. Oh yeah! Once once you see the shift and you you recognize it in a client, then that is set and it, it's not going to change. It's, it's massive, absolutely. Could I share something that I think might elicit and, and really articulate what I was trying to say? Because I was I was just brought back there, you know. So my son, I'm not going to go into this, but he had a neurological um, strep called Pandas. He had an illness when he was four. He's never been the same. He lived in my household, a high stress household where there was a lot of dysfunction um, and a lot of success now that we're not married you know now that we're not married anymore we have figured out how to be very good to each other and that's where we belong talk about knowing where you belong that's where we belong but my kids endured the trauma of having two parents that didn't really like each other but who desperately loved each other and couldn't figure out energetically the words that matched the, the the struggle that we had in our in our in our marriage that again transferred to our kids so there was a day post breakup where I'm driving down the street to baseball practice in the front. And the only way I could communicate with my older son was potty humor or first grade humor. I like to call it, say something stupid. And that's the only time he would give me side eye. Otherwise he was literally, it was like he was steering the car, even though he was in the passenger seat, he was in locked straight ahead, really intense focus, ignoring me, putting up a big wall. And I'm a lover, but I mean, I have a lot of energy, but I'm just like, love me, love me, let me love you. There's just so much energy. So imagine being my child, Paul, first of all. Don't imagine being my, pop. Don't, don't imagine that, by the way. So he's in this completely stricken position day after day after day in, in my car. And I finally just looked at him and I said, Are you scared of me? No. Are you uncomfortable right now? Yes. Would you like me to stop talking? Yes. May I touch you? Fine. I reached over and I found a place on his back. I just put my hand on his back, which was right behind the scapula, the angel, like the road container cuff. And it was hard as a rock. And then he softened. And I tried that a couple times when I recognized the key with me to connect with my own child who had so much anger because I couldn't figure out how to have a loving family, a loving home. The way into him was through his energetic body to find soft spots on his body. And now our thing is we don't ever talk to each other, even though we're going to college. What I do is I rub his feet. He will give me his feet. He'll just stick it right up there in my feet. And I, I go, oh, you want me to love you right now? And after he softens, then we can talk. But I share that with parents. I actually share that with all of my students is we have to love them. Like the five love languages, we have to love the people that we brought into this world the way that they want to be loved. And we have to get over ourselves. We have to relax. I know my son loves me. I know we have an incredible relationship. I know there's, it's a struggle. I know there's jealousy, you know, sibling rivalry there. There, he has his own disappointments that I didn't bring him. And so I know that long winded way of saying is I watch a lot of my families desperately, desperately, desperately want success for their child because they know what our kids are faced with the challenges in the world. So they want to make sure that these kids are set up, except I just don't believe that that system's going to exist the way that we see it. We just need to relax just a little bit and trust, trust the people we brought into the world. You make it a brilliant point there. It's that we need to teach our kids to be adaptable, to trust, to love, and to be adaptable because yeah, things are changing. When I was growing up, there was no such thing as mobile phones. There was no such thing as the internet. 
And that's all within the space of, you know, less than 30 years. And so 30 years from now, what on earth is life going to be like? And we need the biggest skill we can teach our kids is, yeah, communication and the five love languages you mentioned, but also to adapt to the changes that are inevitably going to happen. Yep, absolutely. I'm not 100% sure how to do that, <laughs> but I really do believe, I do blink. Is that a new word of blink? I do believe that the link, the link, see, it happens all the time. I mean, can you imagine being five and it's like you speak another language and it's called Marnese. Um, I believe in the link to where we become adaptable is softening with what our, uh, what our, I mean, somebody said it to me and I'm like, that's brilliant. Where did that come from? And I'll say it right now that dragons are my um, expectations are my dragons. What is the expectation of what they, who they are and how they are You're thinking about that one? I hope. Um, so that I think makes us adaptable is that when we remove ourselves from the expectation that my life has to look something like my parents and that the world has to look like it does now, because I don't believe that it will. And you start practicing non-attachment. You are so much more present with who you are in the world today. It's more than presence. You are just more aware of yourself, of how you're living today. I'm not, me personally, I'm not, I'm not absent of what's 30 years down the line. I have the same fear. I'm worried I have children. I want grandchildren. What I keep reminding myself is to stay resilient and to stay buoyant is to stay light. And that doesn't mean BS it away. It just means that could happen. Okay. We could do that. Let's see this. And just love ourselves so much right now. We've kind of come full circle because you talked about, you know, being in the moment and loving yourself and breathing is part of that. Being resilient is being able to take care of your body and look after your body and breathe away stress and breathe in relaxation. And that, again, gives you the, the flexibility to, to be able to face whatever's coming. Well, you just actually almost said exactly what that secret recipe is. And uh, not only when you breathe, are you creating time and space physiologically on every level of self? What you are doing is you are practicing handling stress. You're not just calming yourself down. That is an application of breath. But you are also practicing, depending on how you breathe and when you breathe and why you breathe and how you apply it into real life, is you're practicing slowing down stress. The stress doesn't go away. The anxiety doesn't go away. The relationship of the body to it relaxes and subsides. So the emotional attachment is what we're really talking about. The energy of the stress goes away. It just slows the process. So right now, when my dog was being eaten alive by a pit bull yesterday, and let me tell you, I was not relaxed and I was not calm. I was screaming. For those who are listening, who are not talking to Paul and I before this, that yesterday I, wit I witnessed really horrible things. One was watching my dog being breakfast for another dog. What it did was my body, I breathed, my body took a long time to come down, but my mind instantly said, or okay, that mom of that dog is not okay. She'll be okay. I need to handle my dog and I need to think fast because my day needs to proceed. And yet I have a sick dog and I have a child at home and we kind of figured it out. And I would say, because I breathed so deeply and I know my apparatus and I know my instrument and I know what it can do for me is that really helped me. And I'd really like to nail this home. I recognize that as physiologically, I have so much cortisol and adrenaline in my body. That takes about two hours to really go through the whole body. You can't wish it away. You can't breathe it away. A chemical is a chemical. If you smoke pot, you're going to get high. Um, not saying you should, not saying you shouldn't. But what it brought me to was emotionally, I recognized that my big foundational turning point moment was a near-death experience. And what I have lived in that moment was my own trauma of trying to save my dog, knowing I couldn't, which I did. I didn't know if I could, but I did. And I recognized in myself that I was 
physically remembering that trauma that happened to me. Will I live? I'm like, will my dog live? How, who's going to help me? Somebody helped me. Somebody helped my dog. I didn't get that dog off my dog. It took three people. Um, and what do we do now? That happened for me. What do we do now? How do we clean up the wounds? That's what I did for my dog. And now we're just living through it. But it took me two full hours with this real commitment to breathing for myself, taking care of myself, showing up to my practice where I was able to walk myself down, talk myself down and be very clear with myself. What do I need to be okay right now? And still not make it about me and make it about my dog. I hope that was clear. It, it was breath work created so much space to fully understand what had happened. I think it was brilliantly clear, Marty, because this is all about resilience. It's about not avoiding situations because we can't avoid situations. It's about Perfect. something happened and finding the most appropriate way for you to deal with that. That's what resilience is all about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I really had, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, for that incredibly respectful response. I think what was hard for people to watch our experience because I had to teach a class right after is that the teacher asked for help. One, two, I'm fine. Three, to be so the, th the idea of presence, I'm going I'm to make sure I'm going to, you know, quote around this. The idea of being present isn't disconnection. It's to be present. In my, in my present moment, I was flooded with adrenaline. I was flooded with, you know, uh, lots of uh, different chemicals. And I had to teach a how to get calm class, which worked for me very well. But it was amazing to be present of mind of, oh my God, is my dog dead at home with my son? And watching my own levels come down. But uh, what was so magical to me as a student of my own life is I recognized for the first time, and again, this has no context, except if you picked up on, I had a near death experience. I mean, not like I floated out of my body, but will I live tomorrow? Was my mind is okay with my story. My body st still revisits the trauma. My mind is okay. My mind was totally at peace. My body was like, fuck, here we are again. <laughs> here we are again. Gotta work ourselves down. Yeah, it's called life, isn't it? Yeah. So, Marnie, um, listen. Sorry, yes. go on. I was going to say, I, I could sit and listen to this, you know, have this conversation with you all day long, but we do need to try to close at some stage. Sure. Um, what are you doing right now? Have you got a, a course or a book that's coming out? Do you have space for more clients? What's, what's happening? Um, yes, I have space for more clients. I don't actually have that much space for more teens, so I have to create new programming for them. I live, again, in the Washington, D.C. area, so my in-person coaching is I really love to work with people who are really, really ready to accept themselves as is, as a character. And so again, I have really high end clients and I have people who we still barter. Um, but the group class that I'm offering soon and hence where we met is I am about to launch a program in February called Love Yourself Silly. And it is for the non-for-profit minded, in a sense, it's for the do-gooder, whether you're in big business, little business, or a mom at home, to real, what we're doing is basically an antithesis to a retreat. We are doing an odyssey. It is in my firm belief, and I would love for anybody to reach out to me, is that we are not in a space right now to disconnect from our world. But we are very, very, very conditioned to be in a space where we need to change our environment so we can learn more information about who we want to be when we go back to our own little microcosm of our own personal world. So we're setting up a line of workshops that will hopefully happen about six times a year that are considered odysseys where you really get to flush through your crap, rewrite your story, but fully understand what it is you are committed to and what character you are going to play, which out when you go back. I'm really happy with who I'm working with. She's a dream. It sounds really, really interesting. I might put my name down for this. Where, where do we find out more? Where do we reach out to you? 
Well, I have a website that is constantly in reconstruction as I shift, and uh, I think you're going to put it in the notes, but it's universal space. Um, one of one of my beautiful stories is I literally had the Jerry Maguire moment after my near-death experience about four months later. I had literally, I was literally jolted. I don't mean figuratively. I was woken up, up out of sleep, jolted out of bed, felt down my body, and uh, just knew what I was going to ha- what I was going to do basically. And the name Universal Space came up about within that month with a little bit of kind of um, whiteboarding and creating that. So my website, you can find out more about me. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I write every day pretty much on Facebook, and I have some private groups where I actually teach breath. So I do, people will reach out to me, and I would certainly love if people reached out to me, asked questions about how what breath would work for them, just to make a quick shift if they aren't in my sphere. There's a lot of people doing this kind of work. Marnie, thank you so much for your time today. Any kind of final thoughts, final words you'd like to kind of get out there before we finish? Yeah, I think it's nice. Thank you for asking me that. I appreciate that too. I, I think, you know, every conversation is very unique and very different. And since I wear so many different hats, you don't know which Marnie's going to show up. But so if I was just going to extract one mantra for today is live and let live and just be as yourself. And when you are the calmest version of yourself, you have so much more space. There are so much more colors can come through, just like a kaleidoscope. So just if you rela- if we find how to relax, we find how to love ourselves, silly. I, I, we've talked about that, how to really love ourselves. And I don't mean self-care. I mean appreciation. The world's brighter. The world is lighter. And you will see so many more innovations out there that give us hope. That is so beautiful. I'm not going to say another thing except thank you for watching, folks. Thank you for your time, Marnie. And I'll see you all again soon. Bye now. Bye. Thank you so much.